<laughs> Speaking of people who have great things to say, we're awaiting the arrival of Jay Billis, who called the game for ESPN International. He will join us in just a little while. So the national championship game is set. Purdue and UConn, 920 Eastern time on Monday night. Bowler up, lost to the great UCLA dynasty in 1969. It'll be their second national title game appearance. No team from the B1G has won a title since Izzo Spartans did it in 2000. Purdue beat North Carolina State by 13. We had a couple of double-digit games in the national semifinals that felt a lot different. Alabama was in the game for a while. NC State sort of got steamrolled a little bit. Look, that was an amazing run. But boy, did Purdue do a great job of taking DJ Burns out of the game and really not leaving much doubt for him after the first few minutes of the game. Their defense, Purdue's defense was absolutely terrific. They played DJ Burns man to man. They didn't scrape down. They did a good job of, of pressuring the basketball, except for Horn during that one stretch. They couldn't find a good shot. If it was a shot, it was a contested shot. And then even though they turned it over, there weren't turnovers for touchdowns. They had those 16 turnovers, but they didn't re lead into runouts. But what they did do get out of them on the aggressive defense on Edie, they got a lot of inside out open threes, 10 for like 23 from the three. I was really impressed with Purdue just controlling the tempo of the game. And I thought, you know, similar when you see Purdue lose, sometimes you can speed the game up to try to get Zach Eady tired. He played 40 minutes tonight. He played every single every single minute. So you knew that pace was in their favor. They averaged around 69 possessions per game. They had 63 tonight. So, you know, I, I think that's going to be interesting for Connecticut because they give you a variety of different looks. Like, they are two different offensive teams with Klingon on the court as opposed to with Sampson on the court. And I think you're going to see Dan Hurley and company try to speed up the tempo of the game with how they play to get Edie a little bit tired. I think Connecticut runs on opportunity. They run on long rebounds. They run on clean rebounds. They run on deflections and steals. But they also, they want to get into their stuff because of they're course. very, very matchup driven. Both of these teams run really good offense and a lot of stuff in the middle third through their post. But that, so that's what I was talking about, Seth, is pushing the ball with tempo, but also, I'm telling you, Zach Eady, if, if I'm Stephon Castle, if I'm Tristan New, every single time, come here in the ball screen. Because if you want to be in a drop coverage, I'm going to have a mid range shot. It's going to force the defense to rotate a ton. I think you're going to see a ton they, of that action. They're going to put not only Eady in ball screens, they're going to be screens and re screens where he can help. Exactly. They play all that drop coverage. Everyone thinks about drop coverage, which is basically the guy guarding the screener, dropping below the, below the screen so that he can help on any curls. Kind of what actually. You know, Creighton did against UConn. Mm -hmm. But the re screens are what gets you. So, like Castle, he might come up with a flare screen. Roll them, then they're going to turn again. right back and re screen them. And if that's drop coverage, that's going to give up a lot of scoring opportunities and open jump shots. But they do have a plan because that's exactly the defensive game plan that Creighton used to beat UConn. So, that's something I guarantee you that Matt Painter and his staff have already looked at and said, wait a second here. We got a pathway to maybe slow them down. Hey, you know, the thing is, is UConn has looked like a juggernaut in the tournament. But for much of the regular season, some of our discussions on college game day were have UConn and Purdue separated. Now, with all due respect to Houston, Houston ran into some injuries, some unfortunate ones in the tournament. And you know, I think that the one in the three seeds overall, one in three rankings doesn't matter. It seemed like that these two were on the collision course. And now we're going to get it. But before we move on from the semifinals, because making the final four is so significant. Uh, we praised Alabama and rightfully so. North Carolina State. Yeah. I mean, they, they didn't have their best night tonight. They, they kind of uh, ran into a team that was well suited to beat them. But it was it was an impressive thing that they did. It sort of in many ways changes the trajectory of what can be expected and what can be accomplished uh, at, at North Carolina State. They lost seven of their last nine going into the ACC tournament. All right. Then they won five games in five days. And, Jay, Will, you're the one who said it. This is historic. I said, what do you mean it's historic? It's not the five games in five days. It's who they beat. The all-time last 10 years, the winningest team in the ACC is Virginia. Then they go and they beat Duke. And then they go and beat Carolina. That, that five games set up, we all said, wait a sec. Well, you know, can't expect much from the NCAA tournament. <laughs> and all they did in the next two weekends is show up and play. And Kevin Keats, the agility to adjust how he plays was absolutely tremendous. What a great job Kevin Keats did and what a great job his team did buying in when no one gave him a chance. By the way, it just epitomizes college basketball in the finest, right? Like it's yeah. expect the unexpected. One day 
people were talking about Kevin Keats being fired, no longer being a part of the program, to now every Wolfpack member saying, that's our guy, you know, moving forward. Also, you know, I, it, we were listening to Scott Drew Seth talk earlier about injuries. Michael O'Connor only played 13 minutes in mm -hmm. his ball game, really right? And we talk yeah. about not having your floor general on the floor, and it wasn't by any like he literally just tripped and had an issue with his hamstring. He were on the floor. It might have been a different. I still think we would have Purdue favor, but these are the little small things that sometimes happen, which can deter you from winning. He a was game. playing 35 Tough. minutes a game before that. Tough. You know they do say, and you're right. There are unexpected things in college basketball, except for the things that are stone cold locks. So now. North Carolina State matches the lowest seed ever to reach the Final Four as an 11, and mm. now 11 seeds are 0 for 6. Alabama was the 12th team to make its first Final Four and run into the reigning national champion in the national semifinal, and those teams are now 0 for 12. Mm. That means he's on get, a roll today. That means well, we I'll tell you what, he is on a roll. on a roll. You and and you previous visits have they been stopped from cutting down the nets, and now one more win away. And it'll come in a game against Purdue to see if UConn can follow it up and go back to back. Jay Williams, Seth Greenberg joining me here. And, and Seth, you made a great point. We had wondered and talked about it on game day this afternoon. How would UConn respond if challenged? And they won by 14. They ended up controlling the game at the end. But they answered that question a few times tonight in resounding fashion. They had four different times in this game that there was game pressure on them. Start of the game when, the, when their opponent makes six threes and eight threes in the first half. But in the second half, there were three different instances where it was tied or they were down one. And every single time, it was a stop, execution, get the shot you want, not what the defense wanted to give you. And they made plays, made plays for each other and made winning plays. That's a championship pedigree. Dad Hurley talks all, all the time to his team about respond like a champion. They responded like a champion. I'll tell you, they, they really executed in the second half with a sense of urgency on a lot of those closeouts. I think there were a ton of ball screens, which forced them to rotate, and they were losing people in the first half. But that sense of urgency uh, did one hell of a job defensively. I'll tell you, Von Castle earned himself a lot of money tonight, man. Like, th this dude is special. I mean, not only having 11 points in the first half, he made things very difficult for Mark Sears. Even though Sears ended up with 24 points, it, just the way he played, that energy combined with the experience is why you think they're probably going to be favored going into the national championship game. You know, it's interesting to me is we all know Nate Oates plays numbers. So the numbers were we're going to make Stephen Castle score. We're not going to guard him. We're going to defend him with Mark Sears. Mark Sears is going to be a help defender. And all basically Stephen Castle did was that's fine. Bang. Two no knocks down yep. two open threes. Then they double and help along the baseline. Catch. Boom. Dunk. Then they double clinging. All of a sudden, come behind the defense. Catch. Dunk. Nato, it's, I, I totally agree with his defensive game plan about making Castle a jump shooter. That dude responded, but Connecticut responded by finding ways to get him and put him in position to make plays. You see the note there that is now 11 straight double digit wins in the NCAA tournament, which is a remarkable thing. And we started this discussion by saying, well, UConn really answered some challenges. <laughs> they trailed for a grand total of four minutes and 18 seconds or something like that tonight, which is almost four minutes more than they had the whole tournament. But still, I mean, their level of dominance and the number of different answers. It can be Caravan at one point. It can be Castle. It can be Spencer who made so many big plays tonight. I tell you, it's a death by a thousand cuts. I mean, they out execute you over the span of a game. It's a cumulative effect, right? Like Alabama was in the game, and then all of a sudden you see a slow pull away, and they constantly bill on that because they're so good defensively. They lock in them. All those shots were challenged. And Donovan Klingon, I know there's still a ton of room for improvement on what he has in this game. You're still going to recognize the game. Going against Zach Eady will be a different matchup. But still, for him to end up 18 5, I mean, just giving him the ball down low set, that's where he's going to have his advantage. They dominated the game on glass as well. I mean, they dominated the offensive glass. Their pursuit of the basketball was absolutely incredible. You know, Dan Hurley said something in the piece that we put together in our game day show. And it wasn't actually Dan Hurley. I think, I think it was, it might have been Klingon. He said, the way we practice every day, the standard that we'll held to every day, we'll respond because practice is harder than a game. And that's what you saw today, the, the mental, physical, emotional toughness, the execution, the trust of each other, embracing roles, going to the hot hand, all those things that are ingrained in them every single day in practice, the game becomes easier. So you can win championships when you can adjust. 
you have the ability to adjust. So you may mention, Seth, eight threes in the first half, right? On 73% shooting. Second half, they made three on 25%. Just a sense of urgency. There weren't open looks that they got in the first half. And that's how you beat, what do we say? They need to score 16, that's 18 threes? I said they needed 18. They got okay. 11. They got yeah. 11. Five for seven, start the game. The rest of the game, they were six for 16. Five well, for seven. I mean, they, they absolutely shot the cover off. And all of a sudden, they closed out a little harder. They made them drivers. They didn't, they, er, they didn't early help. They didn't over help. They were more connected. Nate Oates has a great team. He is a great basketball coach. coach. I mean, really a special basketball coach. Dan Hurley, and we said it earlier, he's the be he's got a great, great players, a great buy-in and great trust. But Dan Hurley is at the very top of this profession right now. And here's the other thing, too. We talk about the made threes and the number that they would make. UConn limited their attempts. So if they only what they only attempted, what, 23? Yep. They probably needed to attempt 40. And UConn yep. wouldn't allow them to take those shots. They challenged them to score at the rim. To Alabama's credit, they did some. Well, but, also, you know. also, RD, when you inbound the ball and somebody's picking you up 94 feet, you don't have that same freedom to go out and run and to push the ball. I mean, that's what they, they were forcing them to start their offense way far out. And that kind of pressure, once again, I, I know I keep saying this. I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face. Defensive discipline is everything. It's one thing to have defensive discipline. It's another thing to execute it. That's where they beat you with a thousand cuts. Their execution with that discipline. Both sides. Both sides of the ball. That's what, and their guards are so good because they stay down. They don't go for ball fakes and they're long. And they're big and long. Think about it. Last 31 minutes, they only get 16 threes up. The last 31 minutes, they only get 16 threes up. The length of that defense will be a factor in that Purdue game, by the way. By the way, their yeah, length and their size in the back they're smaller Yeah, guards. you're going to run into some of that, too, because that was something we probably didn't really mention that much. We talked about Klingon being bigger than Alabama's interior players. Their perimeter guys were a lot bigger as well. Smith is going to run into that from Purdue, and so is Lawyer to a degree. He's a little bigger, but, you know, that's going to be another problem for Purdue on Monday night, I think, too. It Hmm. Again, it's length in your front court, but length on the perimeter, what does that do? We always talk about ball pressure buys time. It's passing. The ability yeah. to yeah. you take up space, you distort passing lanes, you get deflections, you challenge passes, you force people to run offense a step further out. That takes you out of your rhythm. Also, here's what I do know about Northeast basketball, because it, when you play against Dan Hurley, even his dad, we would leave scrimmages with scratch marks all over are damn You're still risk. salty about that. No, no, I'm not. I love it, actually. <laughs> I, I, I live for it. I'm not salty about it. But I think the way they're going to dig down on Zach Eady off the bounce, if that's one dribble, you saw NC State do it. Like, that's where their guards are really good at, too. Like, if Zach Eady's backing somebody down, you turn your head towards that guard on your strong side. They'll come from the bottom. They'll dig down real quick off the dribble. Nine assists. Almost double-doubles there. Klingon did a little bit of everything with the four block shots and intimidating inside. Shot 40% from three, which... They had had a couple of games in the tournament where they had shot very poorly from three, still won by, you know, 50, but they, but they shot poorly from three. They started the game, they really struggled from the three-point line. It's a collective responsibility. That's what, that's what basically UConn does to you. But if you watch those passes, and especially Samson Johnson, when they play in the middle third of the floor, you can't give help. The ball's in the middle floor. Everyone's one pass away. They run their whole offense from the middle third of the floor. When they do that, it puts so much pressure on the defense off the basketball. It's really fun to watch. Well, they did one heck of a job, especially in the second half when you talk about Donovan Klingon ending up with four blocks in this game, chasing them off the three-point line, making them finish over the top of your big. That's what you have to do. As much as I love Stephon Castle, as much as I love Tristan Newton and the company, I, it, Cam Spencer to me just feels like the heart and the soul, man. Like, there, there's some dudes that aren't afraid to put their nose in it, whether it's him chirping, whether it's him in his face, you know, making defensive plays on the ground, making good passes. That pass you saw the same. What does he bottom. remind you of? Come on now, you know who he reminds you of. Just like Dan. He, he, he's he, Dan Hurley. He's Dan Hurley. <laughs> he's Dan Hurley. That's Dan who Dan Hurley. was. He's, he is like that guy, that pain in it that you can't get rid of. <laughs> that's what you got. There's exactly. always that one that's kid exactly. at the Jersey City basketball club. You're like, you shouldn't be on the floor. And then by the time you play, like, okay, now I know why you're on the floor. He, he is. And if you watch him at practice, if he misses a shot, there's an explosion that Danny would go, you, you, really, you really can't do that. I'm going. Like, <laughs> really? You're telling him you can't do that. <laughs> The transfer has worked out pretty well yes, for, for both sides. He's fit in, and he's added 
He's added chemistry to them. He's added, not that they don't have plenty of fire with Hurley leading the way, but you need some of it on the floor, too. And he's been he's been the perfect fit to step in from a chemistry standpoint, in addition uh, to his skill. Three transfers they had. First, they got Diara, big impact on the team, energy giver. Then they got Tristan Newton, all right? Big guard that can defend. And now they've got Cam Spencer. They're three for three in the portal of guy, getting guys that fit their identity and their culture. I think just considering what they lost last year to think that they were going to have the year they had this year, it just speaks volumes about how Dan Hurley prepares his team. And once again, I know I keep saying the word execution, RD. Oh, you're right. It's the level of conditioning that needs to be at the highest level to execute. That it, that's the difference maker. Like you also felt like, they, like Alabama looked tired by the time the game was over. You didn't see anybody in UConn with their hands underneath. I can tell you that. It was punch and the counter punch and a knockout. Well, let me ask you this. We know they're better than everybody they've played. This UConn team better than last year's team that won the championship? I don't think so. Different. 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 I think That's last year's the team question would win. I asked. They're but obviously they different. They're different, but they're better. Uh, I actually think this team is better. Oh, really? I think the ball's hotter. I think the ball has better huh. energy. 